Hello. My name is Chris Barkley, and uh, here we are at the behest of uh, Eric Flint. I'm here with Melinda Scog Snodgrass, David Gerald, and Aaron Semmel. And we're here to talk about the fun, frolicking frivolity of today's media. Wait, wait, you said fun? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Amusing. <laughs> How about amusing? <laughs> You, like, I'm still waiting for the fun to start. Oh, come on, David. Uh, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, David, why don't you go first? Um, I'm David Gerald, and I wrote the novelization of Battle for the Planet of the Apes. That would be good on anyone's resume. Melinda? Absolutely. Hi, I'm Melinda Snodgrass. I'm a reformed lawyer turned writer and screenwriter. Aaron. I am Aaron Semmel. I am a Hollywood executive producer of television and film. And I am Chris Barkley. I reside in Cincinnati, Ohio. I am a senior black correspondent for file770.com. So um, David mentioned fun. Uh, well, it seems to me that that Ever since the uh, aughts, like, like the, the the explosion of of science fiction and fantasy and horror on television has just exponentially gone larger. But now, but now it's not just boys and girls in rocket ships. It's boys, girls, monsters, uh, 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 <laughs> um, all shapes, shapes and sizes, and genders of people, all having amusing fun if we want to follow David's uh, line of reason. So uh, my question is, my first question to all of you is, what happened? Um, David? Inherited the earth? <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I, I think the uh, entire genre has exploded in so many different directions that it's hard to generalize. Um, I, I mean, for a while, it was just Star Trek and Star Wars and maybe a little Stargate. And, but all of a sudden, um, what with we have, you know, Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and, and Disney and Apple and, and God knows who else with their own channels that um, everybody it's it's uh, everybody wants to have a hit show. And there's several ways. There's horror, science fiction, fantasy and romance. Um, and maybe a couple others that I'm not really paying too much attention to. So what happens is you get a lot of people who are reinventing the genre in their own image, which is a good thing in that we're getting an amazing, you know, everything from Walking Dead to The Expanse. But to try and generalize, um, I, I feel like a guy caught up in a tornado uh, saying, gosh, it's windy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> You know, Melinda? I'm gonna, I actually am wondering if some of the, that, that this migrated. Um, I play video games, and I think some of this blossoming of science fiction and fantasy started in the gaming industry, which is actually in many ways bigger than our business. I mean, you know, um, when, when a, game, a new game drops, you know, they'll make 60 million in a day, you know, with people buying and downloading that game. And an awful lot of those games are either science fiction or fantasy or zombie based, you know, horror based. And, and I'm just wondering if, if that, as younger executives and various people moved, you know, between the two, the two mediums, that they carried that with them. I mean, I'm not complaining. I have loved science fiction since I was a kid, you know, and went from book writing to working in television. But uh, I, I do think it's amazing because, you know, it used to be we all sit around and go, oh, we get no respect. Nobody loves us. You know, we're the step, ugly stepchild. And now it's like, no, we rule. You know, we rule everywhere. So. Uh, Aaron, if I can oh, put in ahead, a thought ben. here. Oh, I think Melinda's is absolutely right about the games. I was uh, on my phone during the, you know, self-quarantine looking for games to play. And almost all of the things I saw had fantasy elements. There were, you know, knights and princesses and dragons and whatever, or science fiction elements. And there are too many. It's, it's like the game market is uh, flooding as well because, and part of that is so many, there are so many good programmers out there now, 
same way there's so many good writers out there now. So yeah, I think Melinda's right. Uh, Aaron? I mean, I would agree with, with both of you. And I, I would actually take it one step further though and say it's been an, an evolution that's been ongoing that even predates video games. Um, I mean, if I really looked at what we're talking about in, in our business talk of Hollywood, we call this fandom the world of fandom, which is science fiction, video games, horror, anything that can have a cult-based fan base that would lead to conventions and this uh, connection between the creators and their audience. You know, that's the, the fandom world. And I mean, in my mind, I always say, I feel like it goes back to comic books. I mean, you have generations of people who are raised on comic books and the creative people tend to be this alternative culture type of people tend to be you know that the people who lead to creative lives tend to live outside the the normal circles the they tend to be outside the box thinkers and they tend to be more of the alternative culture so like Melinda said, when we were kids, we would we were the nerds. Like if you read comics or if you read science fiction or if you played video games, you were a nerd. If you believed in a zombie apocalypse or even remotely had fantasies about it, what a what a geek. I mean, that was what we heard. But as those myths evolved with the people, now we all grew up. You know, and now we're put into these creative positions where now we've become creative. And like we said, we come from this alternative culture where our favorite stories were these science fictions, these horror stories, these time travel stories, these stories based on video games. We just grew up playing and daydreaming about these things. And now we're put into these creative positions where now we're making content, whether you're writing it, producing it, directing it, starring in it, whatever. You're in these creative outlets now. And I believe we all go back to our roots. So as that's kind of evolved with all of us, we've now gotten to a place where, like Melinda said, nerds have taken over the world. I mean, we now have a position where the, the alternative culture, which the creatives thrived in and grow up in, has now become the mainstream culture. You know, a lot of times I wonder where are we going to go for this? Because eventually bubbles burst, you know, things happen. What, what is the next storyline? Because I feel like for 30 or 40 years, again, science fiction, fantasy, comic books, video games, I feel like they have dominated the, the creative consciousness of our entire global society for so long now. Whereas before they came in more waves of 10 to 20 years, things would kind of shift. It's just been so dominant now. It's like, what is the next storyline? What is the next fun thing going to take us to? I have no idea. Yeah, uh -huh. I, admit, I, I have this terror that we're going to become the Western. <laughs> you know, exactly. Like we already have. We already have. The Western well, has disappeared. Western we're it. Dying. But, you know, science, the, the, as in the Western dying and disappearing, as a as a means of entertainment i'm hoping that that doesn't happen to us at least not until we all get to make all the cool stuff we want to make <laughs> and all the cool money <laughs> yeah, um, i think it's too late we're all we're already the western um and and i think the first warning sign was when they did magnificent seven and uh uh, uh as uh, battle beyond the stars and outland which was high noon and uh, a couple others um but, you know, um, coming off what Aaron said, which was, I, I thought was very profound, um, I was sitting and talking with uh, Steve Barnes and Dan Moran and Carl Martin last night. We were having a sanity evening. Um, and, <laughs> uh, yeah, eight feet apart, you know. <laughs> but um, Steve made a good point, which is that, people writing today grew up watching television written by people who grew up watching television written by people who grew up watching television and that to really break outside of that that those that paradigm requires somebody who maybe came from comics came from video games came from some other dimension of storytelling and wants to do something that hasn't been 
possible before. And uh, 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 Barnes made the point that Steranko came into Marvel and reinvented comics there because he was doing things that nobody else had thought of before. And so I, I think that's really our hope for the future is not the, that the field expands to include lots and lots of people, which is also a good thing, but that the field makes room or appreciates those people who are not thinking like the rest of us. Like, you know, we've fallen into, God, I'd like to do another Heinlein Juvenile, which is great fun. But how about somebody who comes in and says, I want to do something that nobody has done before? Wait, careful. Hollywood gets very scared when you say those things. Oh, yeah. And, and Hollywood, everybody wants to be the, number two at being number one. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but occasionally somebody in Hollywood rolls the dice and you get something like Galaxy Quest or The Matrix yeah. or, or, the fall. Or, or, or something like that. Yeah. And, and it pays off. And suddenly Hollywood's very interested, especially if it makes money. Well, Star Wars is the best example. And everybody thought Star Wars was going to be a big flop. Suddenly it's earning a billion dollars. And everybody's, oh, we want one of our own. Yeah. And look well, how that turned out. I, yeah, I, I was going to point out, too, that I love the expansion and the, of the inclusion of who gets to be playing in the sandbox now. I mean, um, Aaron mentioned comics, but when I was a kid, um, not many women were reading comics. I mean, that was not a place that we, you know, we felt welcome. And I think in some ways, the, the expansion of, of the, the comics and the, the science fiction and everything into a different medium, it widened it so that women and girls became interested. Um, I mean, I love Comic-Con because it's, it's the most diverse conventions. That, the comic conventions are so much more diverse than a straight up science fiction convention, for example. But I think that this is only, you know, it, the churn has become good for us because we have in people that normally wouldn't, would not have been included back in the day. I mean, you know, I, I know now there are a great many, you know, female comic book writers and, and readers, but that was not the case, you know, back in the, the, the golden age. And I think that by moving into games and to television, it opened this world up to, for other people to become fans and then ultimately to become writers and creators. So, you know, yeah. I, I like that fact. I want it to be a bigger tent and, and have more of us playing, just like David said, to bring a fresh perspective. Yeah, I love the, the diversity too. It's, but I've seen, uh, exponentially speaking, I've been in fandom for going on 45 years. And there were times back in the mid 70s going into the uh, 1980s where I was practically the only black person at a science fiction convention. But now, now I see hundreds of people of uh, people of color at conventions, which I think is terrific because I think that for a long while they were the hidden audience of science fiction and fantasy comics and, and all sorts of uh, cult-like uh, genre pieces. But we saw that at the Star Trek conventions, that the convention started out mostly white, and suddenly they were dominated by women. The Star Trek conventions were put on by women and dominated by women. But then we started seeing black women showing up because of Ahura. And, and over time, the numbers grew. And it was really exciting to see all of the uh, the Ohora fans, and uh, I don't know that Nichelle realized the impact she'd had on fandom. Um, I know the Martin Luther King story, he told her not to quit the show, but I don't think she realized for the longest time the impact she had on the audience. Mm. Oh, I would agree with you. Especially if we're going to talk about inclusion, again, just to, this is a good time to talk about Star Trek and how that was a, a mythology of a world of full inclusion. You know, it really, yeah. it became, Almost. it was a mythology that Gene preached so loudly that, that, that not only fandom heard, heard it, the whole world heard it. It was like beyond the fans of the show. It really became this universal message of like, why in the scale of the universe, why are we worried about such petty differences as race or religion or social standing is like, None of that matters. And that was the heart of the show. And that's what led to great things like Ohora and other just amazing breakthroughs that that show did. 
I was going to talk about Star Trek because, I mean, you're on, David. You, you only mentioned Planet of the Apes, but... <laughs> and it's funny because... He's I actually, being modest. I, I met Melinda on the, the... We did a Zoom call for another panel for this uh, convention, but I've actually met David prior to this where we met... Do you remember? We met... Uh, we had yeah. to talk about some of your scripts and stuff. Um, so Yeah, I hope you get a chance to work together someday it would be great fun it would be great um so S star trek was just so crazy and it was so influential that for me and i'm we just were talking about how hollywood executives have gotten you know evolved with this i grew up out of the star trek timeline like the show wasn't on when i was a kid it was on reruns it was in syndication i grew up with a dad that showed me that show and it was the type of show that made people talk. So it was like, I wasn't just seeing the show. My dad was talking me through the show because I'm a little kid and he's explaining things to me and things. <laughs> so I grew up like that. So of course it makes sense to me that now we're seeing an explosion of this Star Trek franchise, which is a huge discussion point right now in Hollywood. Paramount is ra aggressively trying to figure out how to reboot or do the franchise, continue the franchise. However they're going to do it, they see it as ripe as something like Star Wars, you know? Um, so Maybe Star Trek right David now I, is I a mean, focal point. I think David point. and I have some thoughts on how they can continue this franchise. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm giving sure. us a call. I mean, you know, Mr. Trouble with Tribbles and the measure of a man sitting here. We're ready, guys. We can tell you what makes Trek Trek, I think. There's <laughs> Dorothy Fontana and, and God, I miss her so much. She and I talked from time to time about how we would reboot Star Trek. And we thought that we would reboot the whole franchise from the ground up, but we would start with Spock uh, on, um, uh, on the Enterprise with Captain Pike as a very young officer. He's just come aboard and he stands for, he's the first Vulcan, whatever. And there's this young commander named Kirk on the Farragut and that uh, the two ships have to do some missions together and Kirk and Spock do not like each other very much for various reasons. And then uh, Kirk gets appointed to captain of the Enterprise and Spock should resent it because he should have been promoted to captain. And we follow the development of that relationship. But what we also said we wanted to do was let's forget about the Klingons for a while. They've been overworked and the Romulans and the Andorians and just go out there and have some uh, exploration stories like uh, Mud's women and and uh, the one with the archons and uh, you know and, and so that we're actually doing that mission of seeking out new life and new civilizations, um, and not get trapped into this villain of the week thing that the Klingons became and and then you know after they became crew members then we had to have new villains. Uh, this is one of the reasons why. Melinda's episode, Measure of a Man, is such a great episode because it, is, it deals with the questions that Star Trek raises about what kind of a future are we building and how do we want to build it and what is our place in it by questioning the whole, you know, what is sentience, self-awareness, that, that sapience of aliveness. Uh, that's, those are the kinds of stories that Star Trek has to tell. Well, it, it's so, oh, I was going to say, it's so interesting that you're probably going to get that set up with uh, the new series they're planning, uh, Strange New Worlds, with Anson Mount and uh, everyone else. So do you think you might be my jumping phone on board? My phone hasn't been ringing. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know that they even know that I'm still alive over there. So, <laughs> um, Chris, is this a good place to sort of bring this back to? How does somebody get something on television or how, you know, to talk a little more about the Hollywood <laughs> process and you know, I would, especially that Aaron does, you know, I mean, it's fun, fun to talk about the things we love, but um, maybe people want to know how we, how the business works and, and, you know, we have Aaron who's kind of an yeah. expert here. On, well, it, on hey, if you want me to tell you all I know, that would only take a couple minutes. What else are we going to fill the next hour with? Well, I, I, 
I'm speaking for myself as someone who has longed to get into the industry. I would really like a little insight into how someone today would uh, approach someone to if they have an idea for uh, that they want to do visually, either as a movie or a streaming series or network television. The best advice, and I actually was thinking about this as, as this as the Zoom was coming up because I was like, you know, what can I share? You're always like, well, what wisdom do I have? You know, not much, but. Okay, thanks, know, Aaron. I'll, See you later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, we're losing Aaron now. <laughs> um, but basically, you know, I could share the my experience. I could tell you just for two minutes, let me just share a fun story of how how it all happened to me, so to say, you know. Um, everybody, I believe, who is creative uh, and comes to the storytelling industry, which is Hollywood is only part of, I believe that. So the storytelling industry, all of us on this Zoom call right now are, are very much part of that industry, you know. Um, we come to it for various reasons. When I was a kid, I always wanted to make documentaries with Jacques Cousteau. I just thought Jacques was the coolest and I grew up watching his stuff. And, you know, I, I went to school for marine science um, and a, a minor in film production to learn how to film underwater. Uh, and in my freshman year of college, Jacques Cousteau passed away. And I always say I'm probably the only person who got drunk for two years because an oceanographer died. But I kind of fell off the map and kind of kind of refound myself through my friends I made while studying film production at the University of Oregon. I went to the University of Oregon in Eugene. And while that was a great school for marine science, that's why I ended up there. But while I was there, I met a bunch of kids from LA. And they were what I sometimes refer to as Hollywood royalty, the sons and daughters of kings and queens of Hollywood. You know, uh, their, their parents were you know, creators of some of the biggest television shows and movies we'd heard of and stuff. And I was like, oh, wow, this is nuts, you know? And I would go down to LA with them and I was kind of exposed to this world. And I kind of started seeing how Hollywood worked. And it's, it's so different than, than, first of all, any other business in the world, but it's completely different than the fantasy that everybody has of how Hollywood works. That's something very important is that there's so much fantasy and mythology in everyone's head about Hollywood, when at the end of the day, we work in boring offices, 90% of our job is extremely boring and tedious and stressful for these moments of extreme highs and extreme lows. You know, trust me, hearing no is as devastating in our business as hearing yes is good. So it's, it's these highs and lows that go through. So I kind of followed my way into Los Angeles, stumbling in, you know, not really thinking I wanted to be a Hollywood guy, you know, but my friends thought I, my personality was very good for the industry. So I came out and started having fun again. I'm a very creative person who very much was a storyteller from birth. So I kind of was attracted to that. I started trying to do some writing. I wrote uh, a story for a reboot of the Herbie the Love Bug franchise uh, right at the turn of the millennium, right at around the year 2000. And again, through some friends I had, I was able to meet with the people at Disney who controlled that project. And they loved my story. And all of a sudden I was caught up in this crazy Hollywood dream of being flown out by Buena Vista pictures and you know, put up to do pitches. And, you know, it came down to between my story and this other big story. And at this moment, as all this was happening, I realized really quick, I'm not the writer. I'm the guy in the room. Like I felt it when I was in there pitching, when I met those executives, when I started meeting real producers in Hollywood, which are honestly to me, everyone's going to hate me when I say this, they are the unsung heroes. And I'm not clumping myself in that group by any means. There are so many unsung heroes of producers. I always say the first to get to work, the last to get paid. You know, I agree with many writers that the blank page is completely terrifying to stare at and start. And that is, that is an amazing process. And writers take that leap more often than anybody. The person right behind them is the producers. 
who often come to writers and say, hey, I got this crazy idea. Will you write it? And it's like, now that blank page isn't quite as blank. It still is blank, but there's stuff there. So there's all these things that producers do. And I started saying, God, that's what I can do. That's what I can do. And so the next 20 years of my life was just crazy adventures of following that path. And I worked for big time producers. I got very lucky. I got a job really quick working for an independent producer at Madonna's company. And I was exposed to this very large world of studio um, high-end celebrity production, you know? And then from there, I went to Morgan Creek and worked with one of the largest independent studio producers in the world and made just some great help to make some amazing movies. And from there, I ended up at Think Factory Media making big television on on scripted levels and and then we moved into scripted and we did things like you know Hatfields and McCoys which got really big for us and through all of this you know I, there were there were three things that kept resonating with me that I felt like were three key pieces of advice to people that you could give because you just heard a 20-year career that's totally chaotic and insane so advice number one is there is no path in this industry that is concrete. If you can see a way there, you're 90% of the way to your goal. My dad used to tell me that. And it is so true in this industry because there is no clear path. The way, just like how a story gets told, a production comes together. You know, it's like everybody has a million different stories of how things come together. And honestly, at the end of the day, we used to always say the last one standing will be the one that writes the history book because everybody who worked on it has a thousand stories. And until that last person standing and says, this is the true story and nobody's there contest it, that usually ends up being the one that sticks around, you know? So it's like the number one, no clear path. There was no clear path. There's no advice I could give to anyone to say, follow my path, you know? Because there's a million different ways it worked for different people in here. Number two, I mentioned friends. How many times in that story? Your friends are the family you choose. And in this business, oh my God, does that matter? I mean, more so I believe than in any business. Because in this business, when you start, when I started, when I was 20 years old, everybody I knew was in the business. Now, just a handful remain, you know? So it's all about knowing who you associate with and, and not in a weird schmoozy network way, but just strive to be with the best people you could be with around you. That's what you should do in life anyway. You know, when I worked at Morgan Creek, I worked for a man named Guy McElwain. Talk about an unsung hero of Hollywood. I mean, this guy was started as a publicist for MGM, went on to become Frank Sinatra's manager, went on to found ICM went on to run Columbia Pictures, Warner Brothers, you know, was the agent to such people as Steven Spielberg, uh, Warren Beatty, you know? I mean, this guy was Hollywood legend. And he, he taught me, he said, Aaron, every year pick five people in your life who are just above your status. And, and just try to hang out with them more. Don't schmooze them, don't network them. Just try to hang out with them more. And if you become friends with them, great, that's even better. But look at them, why are they just above you? That, that type of striving forward so helps in this industry. So I always say, look at the, the, your friends, like your friends are gonna help you so much. Look around you, the people around you are gonna be your colleagues in this business, love them or hate them for 20, 30, 40 years. You know, I'm still working with assistants I started with 20 years ago. And again, love them or hate them, we've all climbed the ranks and everyone has different personalities, but we're all working together still, you have to. And that's my last key piece of advice. Number three, collaboration. I mean, it's, you have, uh, our art form is the only one that takes hundreds, if not thousands of people to create. I mean, you look now at movies that are big movies on the big screen, the credits take 15 minutes to run. And that's four columns running at super fast speed, printed totally tiny. I mean, it's insane with all the CGI and storytelling and casting and acting and extras and every little thing. I look at those credits and I don't know what half those people did. 
exactly. except when they get to the production babies part. Then I know what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. They were those screwing parts, around. That's what they were doing. Think about yeah. how big those parts have gotten, just the production babies, because of how big productions are now. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's crazy how, how, how many fingers get, I mean, you writers know exactly what I'm talking about because you guys hate it the most. You guys are the ones who are one person or maybe a couple sit down and write a story. By the time it becomes what it becomes, <laughs> it's usually very different than the story you guys sat down and wrote. I mean, I'm open to honestly admit that because it's all just a big machine. And I always say it's crazy that it works. You know, and again, going all the way back to the beginning, I have no wisdom to partake. I often just say, I kind of understand the machine a little bit. That's all. That's all I understand is how the machine works. So I know how to take, you know, one product over here, put it in the machine. I know certain buttons to press that at the end of the day, you get a product out of it. You know, that's all. Um, it's very confusing and crazy. But I always say, if you stick by those, those three things I say, carve your own path, you know, stay with your friends and your colleagues and work well with them. You're going to do all right. You know, you'll do well. What are you interested? I mean, Chris, are you interested in going in as a writer, as a producer? Or, I mean, what, what's, what's your, what's your drive? Because well, as writers, David and I have actually, there are a little bit more, you know, sort of steps to take to have something to show, you know, uh, like the calling cards. So. Well, um, uh, David knows that I have a, a extroverted side to me, but I've, <laughs> at, at, at one point I, I, I had designs on being an actor, but uh, be, having gone to college and studied acting and then um, gone through a couple of stage productions, I said, I don't think I want this. I, I, I don't want to get to the point where I get, a, uh, uh, I get onto a show become famous and suddenly I can't go outside. I can't go shopping. I, I can't go out to a movie without people, you know. So I, I chose at a, at a younger age to be a writer and possibly a producer because I find being behind the scenes more fascinating than actually being in front of the camera. Although I'm- There's more I'm perfectly... power behind the scenes. Big part? There's, there's more power behind the scenes. As an actor, you have to say what's on the script. As a writer, you get to say, you get to decide what's on the script. Right. And, and it, it kind of irks me sometimes that they give all this credit to the actors. You know, it's like, oh boy, we're going to have a reunion of the actors. And nobody says, hey, let's all say thanks to the writers. Exactly. Uh, the the yeah. writers are the unsung heroes because, you know, nobody says it was, <clears throat> you know, uh, Theodore Sturgeon, who wrote this line, it's they, as Spock said, or as Shatner said, you know, they never give credit to the writer. Uh, very rarely does the writer actually break out like Kurt Vonnegut or Ray Bradbury. The rest of us are, you know, maybe if we're lucky, we get to wave from the back of the convertible. Right. I, I, I found out early when I was in college that writers really hold a lot of power, although Hollywood really tries to squash them down at every opportunity that they get. But the, the writing part is the most important part because nothing happens unless the writer produces something. And, so, and sometimes it's a group of writers. Yeah, I, I will share a story with you. I was on the set of Babylon 5 and they were shooting the episode I wrote, which turned out fairly well, I think. And- um, Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, if I have any complaints, it's about how one or two scenes were directed, all right? So, um, but uh, one of the uh, stand-ins um, was saying that he would like me to write more parts that he got, you know, to do extra work and, and maybe a speaking line. He asked me uh, to, uh, he says, please think of me when you write your next script. And I said, thank you, I, I will. Until he said, just don't have me do any gay stuff. I don't want to do that. And at that point, it was like, bam, you know, as I, you know, and I didn't end up writing any more scripts for Bab Five because Joe decided to write them all. But I would have avoided writing anything for that guy simply because of that assertion, because I felt it was, um, well, wrong. Yeah. And I, I find what's marvelous about today is that if you have someone who's transgendered, or gender neutral or gay or lesbian, 
they're included now. In fact, yes. uh, if you if you recall, um, when uh, the actress who left Batwoman left for her own personal reasons and someone else got recast and they found out she was bisexual, the gay kids, some folks, some militant folks said, no, not good enough. She's got to be 100% lesbian. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Head scratch um, but you know. I mean, you know, the thing I would add to this is, is to anybody, I, I end up teaching a lot at colleges and sometimes high school, but I do these, you know, seminars and no, I always tell young aspiring writers, if you cannot stand to have your work touched, do not go to Hollywood. Be a novelist. Yeah. Um, because my line producer on a TV pilot we shot in Germany, which was a whole other experience, um, once said to the Germans, he picked up the script and he said, this is just a series of suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and which and I've loved that phrase ever since. And um, and I so I always tell people, you know, you are going to have to collaborate. You're going to have to. Everybody's going to have input on this. You know, the the director, the studio, the network. You know, all of these, and eventually the star that you 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 know put in place is going to all have a commentary on it. You have to know how to work with people. You have to know what it is they're really complaining about. I mean, they may tell you one thing, but you're kind of going, what's the real note here? You know, it's that ability to listen and hear the remark, hear the discomfort under what they're saying that makes it a lot, you know, a lot more helpful for you when you're trying to work through these thickets. But again, it's, it is, you have to, uh, another producer, I wrote several episodes for a, lawyer show called the antagonist that only lasted a season i love that show <laughs> i love that I show it was a great show it was I on wrote, for one summer and it was gone i said where the antagonist yeah, i wrote i wrote two episodes but oh. um the producer said uh, to me my best advice to you is write the script film it perfectly in your head and then let it go just let it go <laughs> you know because whatever happens happens um you know, and that's why if, if it's really important to you, then you want to be a writer director. But uh, I love the give and take. And, and oftentimes, I mean, people complain that Hollywood people aren't smart. They're actually enormously smart and they all love this business. We all do. We don't, we don't set out to make something bad, you know, but, um, and oftentimes if you have a great team, the script gets better. The performances get better. A director can bring out a performance from an actor that, that maybe that actor didn't expect. And same for, goes for a writer. I mean, somebody may make a suggestion to you where you, I mean, you know, I'm working on a pilot right now that we're hoping to set up and uh, that I wrote. And, you know, the, the director came back and he asked this very pointed question and it made me go think. And then I came up with a much more interesting explanation that actually is gonna work better down the line in future episodes. Um, and I was like, thank you. Thank you for pushing me that little bit. And you know, um, it was great. So. Yeah, I, um, I, I have a couple of ideas in mind. One I've mentioned to Aaron already, and he's giving me some solid advice on. I look forward to the day that I walk into a writer's room and we're all there and the whiteboard is there and I just start mapping and everybody starts jumping in and contributing ideas because one of the first things I found out about script writing is that you may be as brilliant as you are, but in the collaborative process, you cannot do it all unless you are writing, directing, and producing. And the, the director of photography and the film editor, it's just nuts. You've got to have help. It's true. I always say there's basically three movies that come out of every production. There's the movie that's written, that the writer writes, like Melinda said, and usually films in their head and has it all perfect. And then there's the movie that gets filmed, which is usually different than the original movie that was written. And then there's the movie that gets edited, which is even different than the movie that gets filmed. Mm. And it changes and morphs a thousand ways. And it's crazy. That's why I say sometimes it's amazing it works. And you know what? Sometimes it doesn't work. And we've all seen those movies. We've all seen oh, yeah. the TV shows where Oh, this is, you know, sometimes it comes so close and you're just like, oh, this is just off mark or sometimes it's really obvious, you know, and uh, it's hard because, again, especially adaptation, when you, you're really talking about adapting uh, books or novels, 
into the medium of film or television, again, that's even trickier because you're just talking about two completely different languages. Um, I really like what Melinda said, because I think I said it before, the, the script is just a roadmap. Like that really is how we look at it. That's how I look I, at it. That's how, I hate the people who writers, are, but that is how we look at it. It's just a roadmap to get where we're going, you know? I, I had the people who were adapting The Martian Child into a movie tell me I didn't understand my own story. Um, wow. I let them live. <laughs> but, they, you know, it, it's like, hello, um, adoption works like this. And parenting works like this, and you're reversing it 180 degrees because you know you've never been a parent, you've never adopted, you don't. But you really think it would be cute to have you know to do your version of Elf, yeah. and and I was very unhappy with the fact I you know I, I could live with some changes, but I was very unhappy with the disrespect implied by those changes that they had bought the story, but they didn't want to tell the story that they had bought. Uh, if you, this, um, is, this is a good time, real quick, for a funny Hollywood story yes, here. Yes, please. <laughs> so, when, I was, please. Uh, when I was just a young lad at, at Think Factory, and, you know, I was, uh, at the time, just starting as a, the development executive and helping develop the script for Hatfields and McCoys, which went on to star Kevin Costner and Bill Paxton and became this epic project. Um, this, it all started 30 years beforehand with Leslie Greif, my boss, who was the executive producer. He came up with the, the idea of doing this mini series on the Hatfields and McCoy. So he worked on it for 30 years, playing with the story and several incarnations. So by the time Ted Mann came along, Ted Mann was the writer who wrote Hatfields and McCoys for us. He had just finished writing the show Deadwood which he had written with David Milch. And when we started the process, Leslie said he wanted Hatfields and McCoys to feel like Deadwood. So we went and got Ted Mann and he did a fantastic job. So Ted comes in with this script for the first draft of Hatfields and McCoys. And we were like, so excited because Ted is a genius. He really is. Uh, to just, to, again, a, a genius is, is, a, is an odd word, but just to give you a slight description of his process so you understand why I would use that word. Ted would write stream of consciousness while on jogs. He would go for seven to ten mile runs with a little digital recorder and record stream of consciousness story and dialogue as he ran. And we had two assistant writers who would have to try to translate this stuff into the script, you know. It was just this amazing process and it worked. So in the end, Ted comes in with the script, uh, first draft of Hatfields and McCoys, two night miniseries. Now we all, it became a three night miniseries over this process, but the first two night series comes in and we read this and it was like Shakespeare. It was so beautiful. It was written so well. The story was so dense. We had, there was 177 speaking roles, which is like unheard of in our business. It's like, what? You're going to make a TV show with 177 speaking roles? The story was so dense. We read it. We loved it. We loved it. We thought it was amazing. And we all looked at each other and said, we can't make this movie. <laughs> how, how are we going to make this movie? We were like, okay, we got to figure out how to make this movie. And, and, you know, talking to Ted, and, and one of my specialties that I, I have, I feel like, and, and a, a, people tell me, and it's what I do very well in the industry, is I work very well with writers, because I believe I have a lot of empathy. Like, Ted did write an amazing script, but at the same time, like I said, sometimes those things don't translate into what they need to be to be a television miniseries with act breaks and commercial breaks and all these things that are really bizarre. I mean, really bizarre to storytelling, honestly. I mean, we're all storytellers. Wouldn't it be weird if I told you, you have to tell a story and every two and a half minutes, it has to have a climax that's solved, you know, with a cliffhanger. It's like, what? That's a weird rule to apply to my storytelling. So it's a weird thing, we admit it. So we try to get Ted to kind of think about slimming down some of the story, condensing some of the history, you know, 
combining some of the characters. Basically, we try to convince a writer to go in and mess with his baby, to be like going. And Ted was like, nah, nah, I'm not going to do that. So we thought, okay, let's not be the bad guys here. Let's let the network tell him. So we think the network's going to get on the phone and tell the writer, who's a professional writer in Hollywood, who has written countless for 30 years. I mean, the guy started writing L.A. Law and, and, and things like that back in the 80s. We're like, oh, this guy will handle it great. We set up a conference call with the network and we're sitting in the room with Ted and the network starts to tell Ted, it's amazing, it's great. We just need you to kind of trim it down a little bit. And they try to do their, you know, spiel on trimming it down. And Ted just sits there quiet for a second and then he literally stands up in the room. Mind you, they're on a conference call on a speakerphone. And he stands up, puts his hand on the table, and starts pointing at the speakerphone, screaming at them that there's no way he's going to dumb down his story for their idiot audience. And we're like, oh, my God, this is going really bad really quickly. In the end, we brought in another writer who worked with Ted to trim down the story. We ended up with 72 speaking roles, which is still a very high number. Um, very little of the story, I feel like, was compromised. A lot of what was compromised was the poeticness of the writing and some of the dialogue. Um, and that just had to be done, because some of the dialogue went with some of the characters that we had to get rid of. So, you know, that, that's a crazy Hollywood story of how this process works, how writers you are the first vulnerable ones. Mm -hmm. You are. Because it does start with you. It starts with, right, tell me your story. And then you, you, usually you tell it to people like me. And we're the first ones who go, oh, that's great. But what if, instead of prison, they were in a cafeteria? You know, it's like, what? It's like, what? And, and we're the first ones. to. And then, like Melinda said, and I said, there's a hundred to thousands of fingers that are going to get into this project. And because of creativity and how we all are, we all want to have our creative little, yeah, you know, nah. and I agonize for you writers watching it all. The, nothing's worse than watching a writer on set. Oh, man, they sweat worse than Dr. Fauci at a press conference. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> okay, I hate to cut you off, but we've got less than, we've only got about three minutes left. I just want to ask each of you in a minute or so, what are you watching right now that really excites you? Movies, TV, video, whatever. Melinda? Oh, please don't start with me. <laughs> Give me a moment to get I, know, I did that last time, didn't I? Yes, you did. All right, I'll, 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 I'll start. I just finished watching Enola Holmes. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan, and I love the mystery, but I love what I love is watching the process of deduction. I think that's so much fun. Even though I know it's all contrived, it's still fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just started watching uh, Cobra Kai, which, uh, uh, and I have to give credit to the actor playing Johnny Lawrence, who he was good as a kid in the original Karate Kid, but he's demonstrating so much depth in this reboot um, that he's actually much more sympathetic than the Daniel LaRusso character by Ralph Macchio, uh, who has become <laughs> kind of shallow. And I think that's a great reboot. And I mean, the show has hooked me um, because, and I think it's, it's not just the writing, it's the acting uh, and the directing. They've brought it to life very nicely. Mm -hmm. So that's where I am right now. Notice neither of those is science fiction. Yeah. I'm kind of burned out on science fiction because I, 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 there's not enough science in it anymore. There's not enough sense of wonder in it. As, as Melinda said, it's turned into the Western mm -hmm. and I'm not, that big i mean i love westerns if i'm gonna watch a western i want to watch a western <laughs> that wasn't what was saying, david but we will argue about this like we do later okay you can be right i i if i misquoted you i'm sorry okay aaron oh aaron real quick um i will say i i'm i'm going back i'm watching the outsider which came out last oh, year oh yeah i'm just a, i'm a big stephen king fan so going back to that uh funny another Stephen King I'm very excited for the stand reboot I was a big fan of the the book and the original 
miniseries. I mean, do you remember that? That original miniseries was so good. Yeah. It is so hard to find. It's not streaming anywhere. You got to really find a, a cinephile type video store to get mm -hmm. a copy of that. Okay. Um, but the, the original stand is fun. Um, and I'm trying to think. I, I just had a baby. So, you know, I, I watch a lot of Sid the Science Guy. Coco Melon. Coco uh -huh. Melon's big. Uh, Moana. Very big in our household these days. Yeah, you want to watch Mr. Mom, too. Anyway, Melinda. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, thank you for the reminder. I did watch Enola Holmes, which I thought was, was charming and great fun and, and you know, just a nice twist. Um, and I re-watched The Man from U.N.C.L.E. movie, which is oh, a yes! it's Love that. little film. Uh, Fabulous. The of the 60s. And then I'm dipping in and re-watching Star Wars Rebels, uh, which I think was brilliant. I thought they did a beautiful job of taking something that started as a kid's show and then became much deeper and much much more thoughtful mm. as it went along. So those are kind of the three things. I'm not watching a lot new, and that's terrible. I think I want comfort food in the era of the mm. pandemic. So. Uh, as for myself, uh, I loved Outsider. Just got finished with the Umbrella uh, Academy. Whew. And I watch the second season. <laughs> yeah, oh. You have no idea <laughs> what you're in for. And I'm continuing to watch Lovecraft Country, the last episode of which, whew, where, where the mom goes off on this little adventure, and I don't think she's coming back anytime soon. Spoiler alert. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for spending their Saturday mornings or afternoons uh, on uh, Eric's panel here. Uh, Aaron, David, uh -huh. Linda, I'll, I'll be in touch with all three of you as my, my uh, project proceeds. And who knows, there may be work for all of us. I love it. I love it. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks, you guys. Thank you very much. Talk to you guys soon.